All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Fortran Uses of NERSC training, Modern Fortran Basics, Day 1, Part 1. Uh, we've got a big crowd today, so I'm super excited about that. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, let's, let's get into it. Uh, so first things first, uh, here's, here's our agenda for, for the next couple of days. We'll be doing uh, kind of four hours each day. We'll have a, a half hour break in the middle for lunch for each day. So we'll have, you know, two days, two parts each day. Uh, so day one, part one. First thing we're going to talk about is compiler error messages and how to fix them. So that's a thing that everybody encounters all the time, and it's a useful skill. Modern declarations, so we'll kind of talk a little bit about what might you see, have seen in some old style code versus what are the modern equivalents of some of the declaration kind of things. Uh, then this afternoon, we'll talk about uh, untangling spaghetti. So if you're familiar with some of the old style Fortran, maybe you've seen some go-tos or some things like that, um, what are kind of the modern equivalents to that and what do those look like? And then we'll talk about uh, using modules and submodules. Uh, kind of the modern way of organizing your code. Uh, then tomorrow we'll talk about derived types and we'll start talking about the parallel features of the language. Uh, then in the afternoon, uh, we've got uh, a presentation on the Fortran package manager. And then if we have time still, we'll talk a little bit about unit testing. Um, I like to make these things very interactive and I've tried to put the, the more important things up front. So if we go a little long and run out of time for some of the things at the very end, that's OK. So I kind of use that stuff as buffer. Uh, but, but it'll all be recorded, so everybody will have reference to all of this stuff later. So welcome, everybody. Uh, the links to the slides, the examples and exercise materials, and the Q&A documentation, uh, the, those links are all available on the event web page. So uh, every once in a while, we'll for, drop that link in the chat for those uh, who are joining late. So we'll talk about some of the logistics. Uh, users are muted upon joining. Uh, you probably noticed that. But uh, feel free to unmute if you have questions. Uh, this is a big crowd, so I want to try and temper that a little bit in terms of you know not trying to have uh, a whole bunch of people trying to ask questions at the same time. So we might try and uh, utilize the raise your hand feature. Uh, you can always put your question in the uh, Google Doc, post your questions there, and we'll try and kind of periodically go and look at some of the some of the questions there and answer any questions that you've got. Uh, the uh, video will be available on the training event page once we're done with the whole session. Uh, we're recording it, so all of that. Uh, apply for a training account. If you don't have a NERSC account, there's a link there where you can apply. It may not necessarily be ready right away, uh, but maybe you can have that ready for tomorrow if, you, if, you're, if you're getting late to this. Um, again, the training materials, there's a link. Um, the materials are also available at the, the all the materials are also available on Perlmutter at that location so you can just grab a copy of that folder uh, or you can or you can get them from the git repository there uh, logistics continued uh, you can you can follow along with this training either on Perlmutter or you can use a laptop workstation with a Fortran compiler installed um, wherever you've got a Fortran compiler uh, you should be able to kind of follow along. Um, on Perlmutter, we have a reservation available, so not everybody is trying to compile and run their Fortran code all on the login nodes. Uh, so please make use of that. Uh, you can either use a batch script or uh, use the salloc command to do an interactive session. Um, but we just tr want to try not to overwhelm the login nodes because this is a large group of attendees, and so you know, if all 200 people who registered are trying to run all their examples on the login nodes at once, it it might not go so well. So, uh, again, please use the salloc command or write a batch script that's going to make use of the reservation that we've got. 
Um, so first things first, uh, I want to kind of address the question that comes. Are we back? Yes. Okay, cool. There's right. a slight black box on the top side where the zoom controls are. Oh, though. yeah, I can just move that out of the way. There we go. All right. Um, so I uh, want to talk a little bit about one of the things that always comes up is why Fortran? Um, it is the oldest high-level programming language invented back in 50. The, the timeline's a little varied, but somewhere between 53 and 57 is when it's credited as being invented uh, by John Backus at IBM. And then, you know, people have been using it for high performance computing ever since, right? Like Fortran's bread and butter is high performance computing. It's still one of the fastest languages in benchmarks all the time. It's used for benchmarking supercomputers all the time. Uh, Fortran's bread and butter is just that it's fast. Um, and it explicitly targets science and engineering applications. And you can see from the graph graphic here that it is still widely used at NERSC. You know, more than 50% of users, almost three quarters of users are using Fortran to some degree, whether they know it or not. Right? A lot of a lot of math libraries are written in Fortran. So, um, why why go to modern Fortran though? Uh, a lot of advances have been made in the practices of software engineering and design and language design and the early versions of Fortran didn't have that experience to draw from. So the more modern features, styles, etc. are there really to help you avoid some of the more dangerous things like um, uninitialized variables or un inadvertently mistyped variables or, or thing, things like that. So, so there, there's a lot of aspects that can be more convenient, simpler, and safer to use, right? They're, they, they eliminate whole classes of bugs in some cases. So that's why we want to start talking about modern Fortran. All right. So uh, the first thing I want to start with is compiler error messages. Uh, everybody gets compiler message error messages all the time. As soon as you write code, like inadvertently, you're going to say, you're going to make a typo, make a mistake, something, and then the compiler is going to go, hey, that code doesn't work. So let's start looking at what do the compiler error messages look like? How can we decipher and understand them? And what can they tell us about what what's wrong with our code so we can go fix it? So First example here, um, and if you're following along, I've got uh, the names of the files that we're going to be talking about down along the bottom, so you can follow along, try and compile them yourself, etc. I'm going to do a lot of this interactively, and like I said, we'll try and make sure that we've got breaks in between for questions and things like this. Uh, one thing to caveat the uh, as we're going through these, these are meant to be examples to elicit compiler error messages. If you don't necessarily understand the code exactly, that's okay. That's kind of not the point of this part of the exercise, is just to kind of see some examples of what the compiler messages look like and start understanding how we can understand them. Uh, so uh, there is a typo in this program. So what's the compiler going to tell us? I'm going to do a lot of this stuff interactively. So I've got my own. That was odd. Somebody muted me. That was me by accident. Sorry, Brad. I'm trying to fix another problem. I apologize. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. All right. Um, so I've got uh, an S out command that I ran. So I've got uh, an interactive session on one of the compute nodes. Um, first thing first is how do we use the compiler on Perlmutter? Um, right. Brad, do you mind making the response a little bit bigger, please? I can go a little bit bigger. Thanks. Is that good? Perfect. Everybody. Okay. Yeah. It's always hesitate to. It's always tricky to figure out how big can I make the font and still fit things on the screen. Uh, but uh, we'll, hopefully that's good for everybody. Um, so first thing is on Perlmutter, how do we 
how do we use the compiler? When you log in, I think by default you get the PRG ENV GNU environment, which means the FTN compiler wrapper that is available on Perlmutter points to G Fortran. So if you type FTN dash dash version, you can see that yes, I've got it. I'm using G Fortran, which is fine. You can use it directly if you want as well. If you've got G Fortran installed on your machine or how, however you've got your Fortran compiler, uh, just make sure you can run it. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into the compiler errors examples directory. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of files in there that are some of the examples. Uh, we're we're going to look at the first one. So I'm going to try and compile the very first example that has that typo in one of the keywords. And here we go. So uh, it will print out the line that it thinks has a problem. It will give you a number to indicate which which line in that program it is. So if I go ex if I go open that that file, I, I've got line numbers in my editor. So um, so it it's it's kind of pointing at it says unclassifiable statement at one. So because program misspelled is not a proper keyword that the compiler understands, it doesn't know what this statement means because compilers don't accept spelling mistakes. Um, so it says this is an unclassifiable statement. It, it doesn't know what this means, um, but it is pointing pretty pretty directly at what the problem is. This line has a typo. Uh, and so uh, we also get a follow on error because it never saw a valid beginning to the program, it doesn't expect there to, it doesn't know what name is supposed to be present at the end program statement. And so because I put a name there, it doesn't, it doesn't have a, well, there's a matching name at the beginning. So you're not allowed to put a name there because if there's not a matching one at the beginning of the program. So that's another, that's a syntax error. That's why it says it's a syntax error. And then we get one more that's a slightly different format. And this is kind of historical reasons behind uh, the development of G Fortran, in, in my understanding. Um, but anyway, uh, unexpected end of file, right? It never saw an, a valid end program statement. So it didn't expect to get to the end of the file. So, so one, what, one of the things to note here is that one error can cause cascading errors to, to pop up in, in the program subsequently. Um, but if you fix, fix the typo, now the compiler doesn't complain anymore. By default, it will create a file called a.out. If you, if you want to be able to specify the name of that file, you can use the dash O option and give it a name. And then you should be able to run that executable and it should say hello world, right? This is, this is the quintessential first program that everybody writes in a language is how do, how do we get a program to print hello world and simple as that. So moving on, so we've, we've looked at uh, what is, what did one of the uh, example error messages look like? So let's go ahead and move on a little bit and let's make a, dif a different typo. Uh, in this case, we'll make a typo at the end of the program. So let's jump back and Let's see what error messages come out of that. It says unclassifiable statement again. So on line three, it doesn't know what that means. So, and then we get that same follow on error again, unexpected end of file. It didn't see an end program statement or it didn't see one that was valid. So 
doesn't expect to hit the end of the file yet. But of course, you can just fix the typo. Then it will compile, and you can run it, and it says hello world again. So we're starting to see this pattern of if you make typos in the keywords, a lot of times it's the compiler was, isn't going to understand what that statement's supposed to be. And so make one more typo, see what the error message is here. So keyword typo three. Uh, my, my editor kind of does a little bit of this analysis already, and it's got the red squiggly lines. But what does the compiler actually say to us? It says unclassifiable statement. Again, if the keyword at the beginning of a statement is misspelled, it's just going to go, I have no idea what you were trying to say unclassifiable statement. Again, fix is pretty simple. Just fix the typo, and the program can be compiled and executed. All right. Um, so now is a good time for us to take a look at any of the questions. Um, just... Yep, that's that's true. Um, we'll we'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, don't see what a dot out is. A dot out is the executable that it generates. It's got it's binary code. It's the thing that the processor can actually understand what to do with. So this is how all compiled languages work, is you give a compiler your program, your source code, and it turns your source code into something that the machine can understand. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so the a.out file produced is something that is not going to be human readable. It's, it's for the machine to execute. Uh, what does star mean in the print example? Uh, Star in the print example means list directed formatting. So let's take we'll take a look at this example real quick. Um, this is the format specifier for the print statement. The print statement always says write to standard out. The star is the format. I can actually change the format to be explicit about I'm going to print a character string. Just print it however long it's supposed to be. Uh, we'll recompile that and print. And actually, you can see that when we don't use list directed, we actually don't end up with this extra space in front of it. So uh, I'm not going to go into detail about format specifiers in this tutorial, but uh, if you want to start looking more into that, that's something that you can use to make your output look prettier, basically. Most of the time, you can use star, and you'll get a good first approximation of being able to see what is supposed to be output. Um, I'm also not going to talk real heavily about uh, I.O. in the rest of the tutorial either, but you can also use the write statement. And in that case, this star indicates to standard out. Right, so we can see hello again. So the first star is the unit um, star. Well, the, the first argument to the write statement is the file unit, which we'll talk about later. What file unit am I supposed to put this output to? And then star means standard out, the default output unit. Um, you can. You can be explicit about this. There's an intrinsic module called ISO Fortran ENV that has a um, couple, uh, it has a handful of units defined. And so it, the one that is explicitly standard out is output unit. So that says put it to standard out, 
And then again, this is the format specifier. So if you want, you can be explicit again. And then you lose the extra space in front of it. All right, so hopefully that answers enough of the questions about uh, outputs. Error when trying to use the reservation. Oh, I, uh, I have a breakout room kind of for this purpose. So if, if my helpers can try and monitor that and jump over and try and provide kind of interactive technical assistance, to anybody who's having problems, uh, there's a breakout room created specifically for that purpose. Um, so hopefully somebody can jump over there and, and give you some help. What is the room uh, called? Called support? Uh, support, yep. Yeah, it's OK. So, so if you uh, put, a, put a question in the chat or on here, and hopefully somebody can jump over to one of yeah, those Yeah, you can also put in answer. the question in the Q&A uh, doc. Yep. I'm having, helping one user right now. Checking. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Thank you. Also, I see Adams in that uh, breakout room. Okay, sounds good. Um, are we going to look at how different compilers give similar or different error messages? Um, we can kind of take a look at that real quick. Uh, let me let me show you. So let's let's put this example back to the way we found it. And we'll make that typo again. All right. So, so that's the error message that G4Train gives us. We can also take a look at module load PRG ENV NVIDIA is another one we've got available. So you could try using the NVIDIA compiler. It'll give you something slightly different, but not too unsimilar. Syntax at or near star. It's still going to tell you the line number, um, and then kind of total of how many errors. So different compilers will have different formats for their error messages. They'll usually contain similar types of things. Um, let's see. We've also got. Uh, G V Cray. Cray has their own Fortran compiler. So we can try that one. And you'll get error, uh, file, line, column, unknown statement, expected assignment statement, but found something else. Right. So different compiler messages do their parsing, or different compilers do how they parse the code differently, how they format their error messages differently, all of that stuff will be a little different. But again, you should find mostly the similar types of information. Usually it will point at a line, say something cryptic about why it didn't understand that line. And hopefully that's enough to give you some clues. The, the more you use certain compilers, the more you'll get familiar with their term, the terminology they use, the style they use. Uh, the format so that you can pick out the pieces of information quickly, that kind of thing. And we've got one more uh, available, Intel. And so Intel's will be even, again, slightly different. Syntax error found, compilation aborted. And it's got line number there. So. I, my favorite so far has been G4Tran, so I'm going to stick with that for the rest of the tutorial. What is the difference between print and write? Write can go to places other than standard out. You can write to files, you can write to standard out, or uh, to standard error. Uh, you can write to a character string. So the, those are those are some of the differences. Might right. be useful to make the fonts on Google Doc bigger, please. Yeah, I can do that. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully that helps. Um, pros and cons of compiled versus uh, not compiled. Uh, 
compiled languages will invariably always be faster because it does the step of interpreting what the human readable code that you wrote means and translating that into something that the machine understands. That step is done ahead of time. Whereas a not compiled language like Python, Java, Java is an interesting one because it's like halfway between. Um, but it's things like Python, Ruby, Bash, the interpreted languages, they've they've got to take they've got to do that step of translating from source code to machine code as the program is running. So that's extra stuff for it to do. Yeah, Java is Java is an interesting one because it's it's compiled to byte code ahead of time. And then that bytecode is interpreted. It's it's got its own virtual machine. Uh, the the specifics of how all that stuff works is uh, you, you can you can take a whole course on something like that. But anyway, uh, so the the takeaway is that most of the time compiled languages will end up being faster. Uh, which compiler should we be using? It's to a large degree up to personal preference, they've almost all got different sets of bugs. And uh, many of them support different sets of the features of the language. My, my preference has been to use G Fortran because it's been, it's been free for a long time. So a lot of people have written code using it that other compilers might have bugs that affect the code that's been written with G4Tran. So my my kind of go-to is that the, the G4Tran compiler is kind of the de facto, it will work for most people if that's the one you're using. But like I said, there's there's pros and cons. Like if, if you're really focused on performance using the Co array features, Cray invented the co-array features of the language, so their compiler is going to be the fastest at it. But like I said, if they've got a bug in some code that some that's affecting their ability to compile some library that you're using, well, then you kind of go with what works. Given Pro, would Cray Fortran compilers be more efficient? Yeah, uh, I've. I've had people tell me that the Cray compiler is an order of magnitude faster for certain cases than than G Fortran. But it's on the use case though for GPU yeah. code, NVIDIA compiler is even faster. Right. You know, if you yeah, if you want to use if you want to use make use of the GPUs, then you're kind of stuck with the NVIDIA compiler. I think Intel Intel can do automatic offloading there's a new there's a feature of the language called do concurrent nvidia i know can do automatic offloading onto their gpus maybe some others but i'm not sure uh, and then intel can do automatic offloading on their compilers or on their on their gpus right so like i said it's there's there's lots of things to consider when picking a compiler and Ideally, you could use multiple compilers to make sure your code is is as portable as possible. Sometimes you have to pick a subset. Sometimes you, only one will work. It, there, there's lots of considerations to make. Um, I think that's good for now. Let's let's do an exercise. So I have a program in the compiler errors folder under exercises, exercise 1.f90. There is a typo in this program. If you can, try and compile this program, see what the error message looks like, and see if you can fix the problem with the program, get it to compile, and get it to run. Uh, we'll give a few minutes for people to start trying that exercise. Uh, I will monitor the, the, the Q&A doc for a little bit. 
while while everybody has a chance to try and go through the exercise. And then uh, in a few minutes, we'll come back and I'll I'll demonstrate what the solution looks like. Brad, do you have a list of v, uh, the VS Code extensions that you use on Perlmutter? Is it just the Fortran uh, plugin or there are more? Uh, I think it's just the modern Fortran plugin. And I haven't gotten it really thoroughly set up on Perlmutter. I, I still do most of my code development locally. So, so I've got VS Code, all the plugins set up locally. But for demo purposes, I've got it connected to Perlmutter at the moment. Yeah, someone asked below about setting it up. Okay. Um, yeah, you could. We could spend a whole another half an hour going through that. So, in the in the interest of time, I just kind of assume that if you'll at least have enough of an editor and access to a machine that you can follow along. All right, so hopefully everybody's had a time to at least uh, try and run the compiler on this example. So let's let's take a look at take a look at the example and see what we see. All right, so there's the file. Um, this is my my editor does highlighting, so it generally ends up being. Uh, Good hint, but let's go ahead and try it out. FTN exercise one. So the very first error message is usually the one you should start looking at first. Unclassifiable statement. So when we've seen that so far, it's a typo. And so there's clearly a typo on this line. And so if you look closely at it, you'll see that uh, the word function is misspelled. We forgot an I there. So fix that error, and then you can see hello world. This example is now starting to take advantage of some additional features of the language. Um, you can use a contained statement inside of a program to put uh, additional procedures after that. Um, this 
we'll, we'll start talking more about interfaces a little bit later, but uh, this gives the advantage that the compiler can see what the interface to this function is and make sure you're calling it correctly. Um, we're using allocatable deferred length characters, uh, string concatenation. Like there, there's lots of features of the language that we're starting to use here. Um, and we'll touch on most of them as we start, as we keep going through uh, more of the tutorial a little later. Like I said, this sec this these exercises are mostly just a, a chance to see the compiler error messages, not necessarily trying to learn the language specifically. But let's go ahead and move on to our next set of examples. Uh, this this category is uh, typos in kind of programmer or user defined names. So this one, we've got a typo in the name we gave to the program. So what, what happens when we make typos like that? Because it is often that the compiler still will be able to, f to tell you that there's something wrong. So name typo one, All right? We made that typo there. What does the compiler tell us about that? So the error message we get is all the way at line three, expected label hello for end program statement. So because the name of the program is something that you get to decide, the first time you tell the pro tell you define that name is the name it expects you to use later, right? So basically it's selling tell the typos here, but it says, well, this name doesn't match the previous name. And then we get that follow on error. It didn't find a valid end program statement, so didn't expect the end of the file. Um, but of course, you know, fix that typo and it will work as expected. The next one, um, we're, we're going to use that more complicated. Uh, example again, but let's jump over and take a look at that. Name typo two. So in this one, let's uh, let's just go through the example of compiling it and see what it complains about. We get symbol greeting has no implicit type. This is one of the reasons that it is highly, highly, highly encouraged that you always include implicit none. In your programs. We would have gotten a different error message if, if we hadn't done it this way. But the, the, the recommendation here or the, the likely culprit here is that I've made either a typo here or at the place that I declared that variable. Turns out the place I actually made the typo is here where I've declared the variable. I've got I and G backwards, right? And so then this will work like our, our other example and print hello world again. So there, there are often two places that something with a name will be referred to. And if you make a typo in one of those places, it's it will usually tell you about a typo in the second place that you try and use that name, because that's when it says that there's a mismatch. Uh, right. So uh, one more typo. So let's see what this one looks like. Um, my editor's given me the red squiggly line already, but let's see what the compiler says. Function gret has no implicit type. I, this time, and, and the previous time, the compiler's even nice enough to go, hey, I see some other things that look like they're spelled similarly. Is that what you meant? And in fact, in this case, it got it, it, got it right. That is what I meant. So time for another exercise. 
I've got exercise two has a typo in a programmer defined name somewhere. Give it to the compiler, see if you can figure out where the typo is. Uh, give you give everybody a few minutes to work on that, and I will go take a look at some of the questions. Compiling the exercise. Error invoking package config. Pray XP. Hmm. That's interesting. In exercise hmm. one, the greet function is pure. It does not have to be declared as a character. Um, yeah, I think I think that's where the question is going. Is that the the output type of that function actually is still declared. If we look at the declaration is here, right? We, we give the result variable a name and then we declare, declare its type here. Can you elaborate on implicit none? So in the old days, variables, the type of a variable was determined by the first letter of its name. Um, turns out that was probably a bad decision. But programs, the Fortran is very backwards compatible. So in order not to break existing programs that didn't declare their variables, they had to add a new a new statement that said, oh, please make sure that I declare all my variables instead of relying on the implicit typing rules. Um, most languages that followed said, either, either said we don't have uh, static typing, so a, a variable can change types, or you have to declare the type of every variable. So that kind of that implicit none statement says to the compiler, please make sure I declared all my variables. Using the GNU terminal. Um, I'm guessing you mean the GNU compiler. Um, if if you can get onto Promoter, you should be able to get access to the files. Hopefully, the you got help from the support the support room. It is the programmer's choice. Um, yeah. So, a a program that is valid with implicit none is valid without implicit none, right? So, but it, it's there as a uh, kind of a check of tell the compiler, hey, please make sure I didn't make a mistake, right? Where it, where it really comes in handy is I'm, I made a typo in a variable name. Without implicit none, that typo, that variable is valid. It just doesn't, it just doesn't refer to the same variable as you meant. Right, so by putting implicit num, you eliminate a whole class of bugs that would have been possible. I once, uh, one of my early jobs, uh, I had, I had a couple of colleagues who insisted that they liked the implicit typing because it meant that they didn't have to type as many things. They once spent two weeks to find a typo. In, in their code, they, they had inadvertently made a typo in a reference to a variable at one point, and the compiler went, yeah, that's just a new variable that you've now 
that is now possible to use. Um, they spent two weeks to find that typo. If they had been using implicit none, the compiler would have immediately told them, hey, you made a typo here. Right? So I promise you, you'll want to use implicit none. Um, all right, so we've got, we've given everybody a few minutes to try out that exercise. So let's, let's go see what happens for ourselves. Exercises. Again, my editor is trying to be nice to me and tell me where the error is, but let's see what the compiler has to say. Exercise two. So the first thing says symbol person has no implicit type. Again, this is why you really want to use implicit none. There would have been no error flagged at compile time without implicit none here. Um, and yes, that is where the typo is. I, I declared this, I tried to declare this variable here, this argument here, but I misspelled it there so it doesn't get a type. Right. And so um, all of the rest of these are follow on errors. Um, the arguments to a pure function must be intent in. It didn't see a declaration for that name, so it didn't say that it didn't think it was intent in. Then this one, I did give it an intent, but it didn't see it in the argument list. So uh, you can't provide intent if it's not an actual argument. And then uh, type mismatch, right? I tried to pass something to this function and it doesn't know what type it's supposed to be able to take. So, so we get lots of follow on errors, but you fix it, compile it and hello world again. All right. Uh, let's go back to type mismatches. Um, Fortran is a statically typed, strictly typed language. Despite the, when it used to not necessarily be quite so strict about, about it when you didn't use implicit none, um, it, it still is, when you say the type of a variable or it's determined implicitly, they have to match. So what happens when they don't match? Well, let's see what the compiler tells us about this mistake here. Samples, tn, uh, type mismatch. Type mismatch in argument person passed integer to character. Um, Open that up. Close some of the old ones. All right. So this function says that it takes a character, and I tried to pass it an integer. The compiler tells me, "Hey, that doesn't match. I can't do that." I mean, we. In this case, it's pretty obvious, right? The code's right there. It's pretty obvious what this function is supposed to do and what I'm supposed to pass it. But when we make a mistake and try and pass something of the wrong type, the compiler tells us about it. But we, we can fix it and compile it. And then we get hello world. Uh, assignment, same thing if I try and assign values. So what does the compiler tell us about that one? This variable is a string. I cannot assign a number to a string. That doesn't make sense. And then the compiler tells us about it. There are some rare cases where automatic conversion does happen. Assignment is one of them, but the uh, the conversion from integer to character is not is not one of those. Uh, it, it will do conversions between numeric types is generally where that's allowed, and the rules are assignment and intrinsic operations. 
So plus, times, minus, etc. Um, it won't do it for arguments. If I try and pass a an integer to a function that takes a real, it will not do an automatic conversion there. And so this one, uh, right? Uh, you know, we, we, we meant to call a function and assign its result, but, but that's the kind of thing you're going to start to see when you try and assign something of the wrong type. It'll tell you can't, can't do the automatic conversion because there are cases where it can do the automatic conversion. All right now on to next example. Uh, what happens if I don't declare? Type mismatch three. Uh, symbol greeting has no implicit type, right? Um, in this case, we actually would still get an error message without implicit none, but it will be slightly different. Can't convert character to real, right? Because, like I said, the the Implicit rules say that um, i through n are integer. If, if the variable starts with the letters i through n, it's an integer. Otherwise, it's a real. So because it's g, it thinks that that's a real variable, but I can't assign a character to a real variable. If I had forgotten to declare if I had forgotten to declare a variable that I assigned to, and the I was trying to assign a real to it, and it happened to turn out to be real, right? I've assigned to the wrong variable, and so you'll get that without implicit none, you end up allowing yourselves to create bugs that otherwise implicit none would catch. Um, but uh, we got one more exercise uh, there is a type mismatch somewhere in this program. Try and compile it, see if you can find out where it is, see, see if you can fix it and get it to print hello world. And I'll go take a look at some more of the examples while you all do that. Or uh, more of the questions. Yep, that answer's good.
All right, everybody's had a few minutes to try the exercise, so let's go see what the compiler tells us. Let's see, what exercise were we on? Three, just making sure. All right, FTN, exercise three. So the first error, symbol person has no implicit type. Why is that? Now I've forgotten why that was the case. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong file. Helps if I look at the right file. Ah, there we go. Yeah, missing the declaration. So, yep, there we go. Yep, the implicit none says you gotta make sure and make your uh, declare your arguments, variables, etc. All right, so moving on to uh, syntax errors. Uh, syntax errors are in many ways akin to punctuation in English. Uh, the compiler is just way more strict than your English teacher was. Uh, if you miss a comma or a period or an exclamation point, whatever, the compiler is going to go, uh, that doesn't make sense anymore because you missed some some special character. Uh, so let's take a look at some of, what some of the uh, examples of some errors you can make in terms of the syntax look like. Uh, this one's got a syntax error on the print statement. This one's pretty, if I recall, the compiler's pretty good at this one. So let's see what it looks like. Samples, uh, syntax error one. Yep. Expected comma in IO list at one. Uh, we, we forgot that comma. Yeah, a lot. A lot of times, syntax errors, the compiler's pretty good at telling you. I think this is where your mistake is. Just like, just like if you're trying to read a novel and the author forgot a period somewhere, you can get it. I think there was supposed to be a period there. <laughs> the the compiler's pretty good at that too. Um, so uh, syntax error in a declaration. Let's see what that one looks like. In syntax error two. Uh, the first error, syntax error in data declaration at one. It's a little bit less sure what exactly the error is, but it knows there was some syntax missing. And then because it didn't see a valid declaration, we get the follow on that that greeting doesn't have a type. Um, but the thing we were missing is that comma there. Uh, you have to put a you have to put a commas between the attributes in a declaration. So again, the the compiler at least gives you well this is the line and there is a syntax error. Hope usually that's a pretty good pretty good clue of well at least I've narrowed it down to a line. But easy enough fix and then it works. Uh, errors in the argument list. All right, let's see what this one looks like. So syntax error three. Uh, my editor is giving us a pretty good clue, but the compiler tells tells me syntax error in argument list at one. Uh, we we forgot the parentheses. Uh, I've seen some cases where it, it kind of knows, hey, I think you forgot a parentheses, and it'll tell you that, but uh, Hopefully that one's pretty pretty clear from just eyeballing it. And then it works. There we go. All right. Uh, then function declaration. This one gets lengthy. So again, my editor is giving us a pretty good clue where where things 
may have gone wrong, but let's see what the compiler says. Start with the, so it gives us a whole bunch of errors, but let's start with the first one. Expected formal argument list in function definition at one. So the, this is kind of referring to the syntax as the, the way the line, language describes it. The formal argument list is a list of things separated with, with uh, commas enclosed in parentheses. So we forgot that parentheses. Uh, and then you get all kinds of follow-on statement. Unexpected data declaration in contains section. So after it contains, you can only put procedures. It didn't see a valid start to this procedure. So it thinks that this is standalone and that's not allowed. Similarly for the next one, Similarly, you can't have executable code down there by itself either. Uh, unexpected end, end program statement. But here, because it didn't think it was inside of a procedure, thought it was still inside of the program, so the end statement it thinks is the end statement for the program. And it says, I didn't expect the end program statement. And then uh, because it didn't see the def uh, definition of greet thinks that it's got uh, no implicit type. Okay, so, but again, that one's an easy fix. If you hit save, and then it works. All right. Let's do one last exercise. There is a syntax error in this program somewhere. Exercise four, see if the, you can get the compiler to tell you where it is and fix it. And I will go look at some more of the questions.
advantages of four train over C. Oh, that one could get contentious. Um, I think everybody's had a few minutes to work on the example, so or work on the exercise. So let's go take a look at that. Exercise four. What does the compiler tell us? Parameter is missing an initializer. Right. So the parameter attribute says that this is a named constant, which means you have to give it a value, which means we were missing an equal sign for the, for the initial assignment. And that fixes it. All right. So that concludes the section of looking at compiler errors and trying to help you get familiar with seeing them, understanding them, interpreting them. Really, the idea is to try and get comfortable with the idea that the compiler is trying to help you find your mistakes. It's not just a, uh, a hurdle to overcome. You should treat the compiler as your proofreader, right? Uh, I know when I was first learning programming, and it, it took me a little while to get comfortable with that kind of idea of I, I would, you know, type, invoke the compiler, and then it would say, I would see long list of things, and some of them said error, and then I would, oh, I guess I better go stare at my code and figure out what's wrong. No, if you spend a little time getting used to reading the compiler error messages, they can actually help you find your mistakes faster. And so spend time doing that. Hopefully this has given you some some examples and some insights into getting used to interpreting those. One of the things is most compilers by default don't check all of the things. I wish they would by default, but a lot of times because Fortran is really intended as a high performance language, those checks can be expensive because a lot some of them have to be done at runtime. And so by default, they kind of turn a lot of them off. Also, a lot of people have a lot of existing code that don't necessarily follow best practices, but would still probably be valid. And they don't, and a lot of times they don't appreciate having to turn off the warnings and errors. They want to just, hey, this used to work. Why does the why is the compiler yelling at me about this now? They, they, so, so a lot of, for historical reasons, a lot of these checks aren't on by default. This is to the extent that I could kind of go through the documentation and find, find a lot of them about as extensive a list of all of the flags that can turn on all of the checking that you might want to be able to do for these handful of compilers. Uh, I probably could go and do the find the, a set for the NVIDIA compiler, but I haven't done that one yet. But I had, I had most of these handy. So my recommendation is if you're writing new code, turn all of these on. If you're encountering bugs, turn as many on as you can, you know, these will help you find the problems, mistakes, bugs in your code. You should try and turn them on to the extent that you can. But moving on, modern declarations. Uh, so I wanted to try and teach this course, not a, assuming that you weren't necessarily brand new to Fortran, but maybe have are coming new and not brand new to programming either, but maybe you're coming, you're, you're interested in learning more about, about Fortran or somebody has handed you some Fortran code and you're going, I need to figure out how this works. I need to start to understand this. I may, pro may need to make modifications so that it does some new thing. Um, so I wanted to kind of teach this from, from the perspective of what might you see in terms of like legacy style, old style Fortran, and what would the modern equivalents be? So uh, we kind of got some uh, counter examples of 
here, here's what you might have seen in really old code. Here's what a modern equivalent might be and, and why it's easier to understand or safer or all of the above. So let's start taking a look at some examples. In the old days, uh, we didn't have named constants in Fortran. Typically, you would see a behavior where you would declare a variable somewhere and these data statements are, they give it, they give those variables initial values. It does not say that you're not allowed to change it later. But that is a potential for some interesting bugs. Because I can give you the wrong, this program will give you the wrong answer for the area of a circle. Let's, let's, uh, let's go run this program real quick. So in modern declarations, in constants, all right, so modern, de modern declaration, come on, see, mod, why is that not working? There we go. CD modern declarations examples, FTN constants that compiles and ask me for a radius of a circle. So radius should be pi r squared, so it should be two squared times three point something, so it should be twelve ish, a little a little more than twelve, right? Why does it think that it's eight? <laughs> What happened? Uh, well, I I put something in there to, to kind of let you know what's what's going on here. It's, I'm in here breaking your geometry. Um, we'd rather not be able to change the value of pi. I know I I know the state of Indiana tried to do that one time, but it <laughs> it doesn't make for proper geometry. Um, so how can we prevent this? The modern way is to fix this. Instead of using the data statement, use the parameter attribute to make a to make things actually named constants. Uh, so if we fixed constants a dot out, uh, the radius is correct, or the the area of my circle is now correct. I can't break your geometry now, right? If we try, if we try and reassign the value of pi, the compiler yells at us. Named constant in a variable definition, variable definition context. So use the parameter attribute to make the things that are supposed to be constant named constants to prevent a whole class of bugs where you inadvertently change the value of something that's supposed to not be chained. Uh, So, uh, and so there's the, the fixed program. Argument intent. Oh, this, this is a fun one. Uh, if you do not specify the intent of your arguments, you can do some dangerous things. So you should always specify intent for your arguments. Intent in out will at least save you from the dangerous things, but I, I lean towards prefer intent in as often as possible write functions as often as possible so that your result value is clear. All of your intents, all of your arguments should be intent in. When you really need to uh, separate your arguments into intent in arguments and intent out arguments for subroutines. But I will show you why this is dangerous. So we've got, where are we at? Intent, that program. There is a bug in this program. You might be able to see it if you stare at it for a minute. Um, but let's see what the compiler thinks. The compiler thinks it's fine. But when I run this, I get a seg fault. Why? 
I assigned to the argument, because I didn't specify intent, that's allowed. But I passed it a literal value. I, it is not valid to assign to a constant. But it, this procedure doesn't know that it's going to be passed a constant until runtime, and then it tries to do it. There are certain scenarios where you can go like multiple layers down the call stack, and I've seen compilers actually not crash. Right? You tried to do an assignment to an argument, and it just kept right on going, even though it was not supposed to be allowed to do that. Um, so, so there are very real dangers with this, and so there are two fit. There are two ways that you would modify this program to fix this problem. You could do intent in out. So if I say, oh, I thought I changed this. Hmm. Um, anyway, uh, I have the example here. Uh, so there are, there are two ways you can change this program to fix it. One is uh, you can do intent in out if you really do want to be able to reassign to your argument. And then the compiler will tell you, hey, you can't pass a, a constant or a literal here because this, this procedure says it might reassign to it. If you don't really want to do the assignment, you say intent in, and then the compiler will yell at you down here and say, hey, you can't reassign to this. You said you weren't going to. My, my preference is generally this one. Procedures shouldn't do more than one thing, right? So it shouldn't print it and reassign to it. Um, but, you know, real world code that's already out there and exists might, might just be simpler to, to do this. I, I could have swore that I must have, must have changed Anyway, I will I will get the the examples in the in here look looking like this one. Arrays, um, arrays are fun. the The language supports multi-dimensional arrays out of the box, um, right? So you can do uh, matrices, one-dimensional arrays. You can define constants of arrays. Yada yada, like it's all it all just kind of works and really well. But there are some dangers with arrays. Uh, one of the things I recommend is if you're going to have named constants of arrays, you use implied shape. When you use the star in the context of a named constant, it's called implied shape, and that just means that you don't have to repeat the size of your array. the The compiler knows how long this is. This is. You don't have to tell it. You can just put star there. Uh, for variables, use allocatable arrays as much as you can. There are some reasons that you might want explicit shape, but I they're they're generally for performance reasons, and you shouldn't worry about that until you have determined that that is really the thing that is giving you performance problems. Instead, make them allocatable and use colon for the dimensions, and then they can be, uh, the dimensions can be determined when you actually allocate it. Dummy arguments. Never, ever, ever use assumed size or explicit shape array arguments. Every time I've seen it done, there is a bug, <laughs> right? So basically, when you say assumed size, the proce that procedure doesn't know how big the array is. You can, in fact, it doesn't even know what the what the rank of the array is, right? If I say this procedure takes an assumed size rank one array. Right, so to one one D array, the actual argument 
might look like an element of a matrix. And the compiler will be just happy with that. You can even say, I want this to be a size 10 array, one a size 10 1D array, and you can still do the same thing. Assumed size and explicit shape array arguments are not checked by the compiler. The compiler does not see if the thing you actually passed it matches. Always use assumed shape. Always. There, so there, there are some arguments to be made that there are potential performance gains to be had by using explicit shape or assumed size. They're very few and far between where it will actually matter. There are other, um, there are other uh, mitigations that you can do to improve performance for assumed shape arguments. If that actually is a performance thing, I, you, you should not ever use assumed size or explicit shape. There, there is a case where uh, it, it, there are some things that do matter for performance for multi-dimensional arrays. If you're going to take slices or do looping, the innermost loops should be the first indices. Because the, the Fortran standard explicitly says that that is, kind of, that is not, not strictly that that's how they're laid out in memory, but the, the implication is that like that's the only way that really makes sense. So the, the first index uh, increases fastest. Or, or, so the, the first one is the one that's incremented as you just move linearly through memory. Um, and I, I saw I saw the question. Can you give examples of assumed size and explicit shaped arrays? And yes, the the example I'm about to give it, go through uh, is very clear about this now. So I have an example here where I've got a program that's going to calculate primes, and I have explicitly done the things I told you not to do, so that I can kind of demonstrate why. So ftn arrays dot f90. So the compiler is perfectly happy with this. I'll, I'll kind of go through a little bit of how this works. So I've declared a variable, a couple of arrays, and then one more variable. So program is going to ask us how high do we want to go calculating primes and read that into read the response into a variable. Going to call this subroutine find primes. Uh, we can see that uh, this ha this is intent in, so and we read it, so we've got a value there. And then intent out, we're going to it's going to return well how many primes were there, and then the array is assumed size. It's intent out, that's still allowed, uh, but it's assumed size. So this is where problems become possible. That array up here, or, uh, primes, is explicitly sized to 100. This algorithm doesn't know ahead of time how many primes there will be, whether that will fit. But the subroutine doesn't know whether or not the array that it was given is going to be big enough. I can even say that the array is 100, is size 100, and the compiler will still not tell me anything is wrong. Even though it, it's clearly possible that this won't fit. Uh, then... Once we do know how many primes uh, for the calculating the squares of them, right? So, that, so this, just to make things interesting, we, we find all the primes up to some number, then we calculate the squares of them and then print them. <coughs> print corresponding values, prime and its square. So then the, 
So for the subsequent arguments, the uh, subsequent subroutines, I know how big that procedure is, or the, the array is going to be, so I can use that as the explicit shape, right? This is, the, this is a really common pattern that you'll see, is uh, passing one of the arguments is the shape of the array. That's really common. And before we had something with the assumed shape, the, the alternative, this was the way you could do it as safely as possible. Because then I, I can at least kind of give the compiler some information of knowing what the array sizes are. But when I run this program, I can calculate primes up to 20. Yeah, that works fine. I can even go up to 500, 550. I believe that works. <coughs> it to put in 550 again. Oh, yeah. 550 is big enough. There are 101 primes. But I can only store 100. What happened? <laughs> I inadvertently got a wrong answer. And the program d didn't tell me. Something weird happened. If I go up to 600, then it finally blows up. I get, you know, a whole screen full of garbage. And then it finally seg faults. What happened? There's, there's absolutely no bounds checking in Fortran by default. It just went, you, you told me that, it, that this array was going to be big enough. I just kept going into memory. And so this is the reason that that practice is so dangerous. There's just so many opportunities for you to just do out of, out of bounds memory access and just completely garbage up your whole program. So the solution is... Use allocatable arrays. I can still do the exact same operations. I'm going to explicitly say that this array is allocatable intent out. This will now allocate it as big as it needs to be. Same thing for calculating the squares of them. The squares array is intent out allocatable. It will allocate it to the right size. The thing that everybody gets hang, hung up on, and this is actually a true, is we'd like to say that these arrays are the same size. But when you say assumed shape, you can't say that anymore. What I always tell people is, This is actually valid, but that still doesn't actually say that they are the same size. For the same reason that passing an argument that says the size of the arrays doesn't say that they're the same size. Right? So the, the mechanisms by which you would like to say that they should be the same size in your declarations don't actually mean that the compiler or the runtime checks that they're the same size. So it's a false promise. And so that's why I say you shouldn't do that. If you really, really want to be able to say that they're the same size, explicitly write that code.
you can use an error stop statement. Um, this is similar to the old stop statement, um, but this works across images. When we get to parallel things, uh, you can do error stop and it brings the whole parallel program to a stop. And you and it can appear in pure procedures and you can give a message here, which you could usually do with a stop statement too. But um, so you can kind of construct some message that you want to print out before it stops the program. Can we use pointer instead of allocatable array here? Can you elaborate on the pros and cons between pointer versus allocatable? Uh, that is a good question. And so let me real quick do this just to show you that this works now. FTN arrays fixed. Dot out. Now we can calculate primes up to 600. There were 109 of them. We can go up all the way to however many we want now. And uh, we, we don't have to tell this procedure how big those arrays are. We can ask their size now. Assumed size carries with it, or assumed shape, excuse me, assumed shape carries with it the size information. Now, to the pointer option. Um, yes, pointers would work here. I tend to say avoid pointers if you can, because allocatable arrays are automatically deallocated when they go out of scope. It is, I think, probably impossible in a valid, it, assuming your compiler works, I think it's impossible to make a memory leak if you don't have pointers. As soon as you have pointers, you can allocate memory and then forget. <laughs> and then that's a memory leak. Um, so unless you really understand pointers well enough know how to do the memory management correctly and deallocate memory when you're done with it. It's an advanced skill. The compiler really doesn't help you. I tend to try and avoid pointers to the extent that you can. It's, it's kind of akin to C++ now recommends that you never use pointers, raw pointers anymore either. Use a uh, unique pointer or shared pointer or whatever, whatever the, their constructs are that they've added to the language or to the standard library, they say, use those, don't use raw pointers anymore. It's a very similar recommendation for Fortran. Use allocatables as much as you can instead of pointers. Okay, so we've talked about arrays. Uh, next, file units. I used to see this, I used to see this stuff all the time. Somewhere, something, some program would open a file with an explicit unit number, and then you'd see this number scattered all over your write statements, and finally there's a close that number. The standard does not say what unit numbers are already in use by the program. There is a pretty well standardized convention, but the standard, the, the Fortran language standard doesn't say, say what it is. So it, it is technically not really safe to use explicit unit numbers. But we didn't really have much of another option for a while. So the thing that can go wrong here is if I forget to open this file, um, this will still do something most of the time. It will, the, the common convention is that the runtimes will 
when you try and write to a file number that has not been opened, it will create a new file and open that file for you. Usually with some weird name like f9 dot something, which is not very nice to your users. The And these are what are called magic numbers in programming. The general consensus is you should not have magic numbers scattered throughout your program. You should use named constants, right? At the very least, give the thing a name so we can know what we're talking about. And it's not a complete mystery as to why the number nine. Um, so this is slightly better. But really what you should do is you should take one step further, which is make the unit number a variable and pass it around to the things that need to write to it. But really, you should let the open statement tell you an unused unit number. There's a new argument to the open statement called new unit, and this will determine a unit number that is not currently in use by the program anywhere else. And then you can use that anywhere. So you should be you should be letting the letting the open statement tell you what the unit number is when you open the file, then use that variable and then make sure you close it. That that's the modern way of doing uh, unit numbers for files. So that's that's the recommendation there. So that is where we are for day one, or for part one of day one. So we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Any of the code you've seen that uh, looks that you're not quite familiar with, don't quite understand, now's a good time to ask some of those questions. We can go look at the code. Um, I can, I mean, I can try and address that if that's, uh, if that's really what everybody wants to hear about, but uh, Perlmutter, yeah, the Intel compiler, well, it's not, it's not officially supported, but it is available. Uh, we'll, we'll put it that way. Uh, what are we supposed to do with compiler flags? Aha, yes. Uh, Every time you open it, uh, no, it's uh, slightly worse than that. It's every time you invoke the compiler. <laughs> FTN dash W all. Um, let's see, what's a good one that's probably going to yell at me? Oh, let's go. Yeah, let's go look at the intent one. Yeah, FTN W all. Dash W error um, intent dot F ninety. Oh, that one doesn't yell at me. Um, anyway, every time you invoke the compiler, the the flags go there. Um, usually, what you'll see is in any reasonably complex project, there'll be something like a make file or a build script or something like that where somebody has written down all of the flags that it's going to use, and it's going to invoke the compiler on all of the source files in the right order using all the flags that, it's, that have been specified, et cetera. Um, so us usually you don't have to like memorize them and write them all out every time you write, invoke the compiler. You'll have some script written that does it for you. When would you use a pure function versus a subroutine? Um, yeah, so a function can only have one output. It has a result, but a subroutine cannot appear in an expression, right? I can't say, I say, can't say call thing inside of add the result to some other, something else, right? So there's that there's that trade-off. I I tend to like functions because I oh, like well, to fit both. because I like to put the results into expressions. 
Um, does Fortran have pointers like C? Um, they are not really like C. There's, there's some analogs, but pointers in C still strictly have a type. So I can't just point at random. I can't say I have a pointer to an integer and point it at a real because the types don't match. So the, the compiler really kind of restricts you a lot more in what you can do with Fortran pointers. Can you give examples? We did that pointer. Yep. What if I forget to close the file? Um, in theory, it would be possible for that to be a resource burden to the system because it still thinks there are open files. But really, when a process stops, the, the operating sort system knows to close the files. So you don't have to worry about it. It's usually good practice, especially because if you do have a program that's going to open lots of files, that is a resource burden while the program is still running. So you should close them when you're done with them. Talking of compiler flags, did anyone see a bad consequence of using allow argument mismatch in gFortran? Ah, yes. Uh, this was an old trick to, usually it would be to al allow you to write interfaces to C. There are better ways to do it now, but usually it would be something like, this, this, this C procedure is going to determine uh, whether you passed it an integer or a real or something like that, maybe using some other arguments or whatever. But the Fortran doesn't really allow this like argument mismatch. And so you'd, you'd see that the common thing is uh, MPI, right? Call MPI bcast thing. And then the other time I'm casting something different. And so it, the compiler sees that, oh, I think this is what the interface to that procedure looks like, because here's where you called it. But then you called it differently down here. And so I don't think that the interfaces match. So that flag would turn off the, com the compiler from checking, hey, you called the procedure with two different interfaces. That doesn't make any sense. So you would just not check that. Um, but that does provide the opportunity that you called other procedures incorrectly. So to the extent that you can, I recommend modifying existing code to allow you not to need this argument anymore. Even if you're using MPI, there's, there are modern interfaces to MPI that don't require this. You should try and migrate to those. Let's see. When would you use, so the there's another aspect of this question that is pure versus not pure. Um, a pure procedure cannot modify any mo external variables. So uh, we can, we'll talk a little bit about host association and scoping rules when we get uh, a little later today, but uh, it's like, it can, it can still look at variables outside of it, but it can't modify them. It can only modify its arguments or the result of a function, and all of the arguments to a pure function must be intent in, meaning, so a pure function, the only thing a pure function can do is look at its arguments to produce a result value. Uh, pure subroutines can have you just have to specify the intent for all of your variables. Um, oh, and you can't do I.O. in pure procedures. So you can't write to a file. You can't open a file. You can't print to the screen. Uh, there's also there's also some rules around polymorphism when it comes to pure procedures. Um, 
basically you can't do polymorphism in peer procedures, roughly speaking. You can't have polymorphic outputs from peer procedures, we'll put it that way. That said, the, the benefit you do gain from peer procedures is there are some optimizations that the compiler can take advantage of that it might not otherwise be able to. And you can put you can call peer procedures inside of do concurrent, which is something that some of the compilers are starting to be able to automatically offload to a GPU. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions. Unless anybody's got anything else burning that they would like to discuss. Um, feel free to raise a hand, unmute yourself and ask. Something like that. Uh, still confused about, oh, still confused about assumed size versus assumed shape. Yeah. So star is assumed size colon is assumed shape. Yeah, and size is the one, so star is the one you want to avoid. This brings along the size shape information. So you can then ask, what is the size of that array? So I don't go out of bounds. This is the more modern MPI interface that allows you to avoid the workaround regarding uh, uh, that. It was actually MPI F08 is the one that I'm most familiar with, but I think most of them now you can just say use MPI. And even, even use MPI F08 was kind of a misnomer because the features that actually allowed you to write the code that would go behind that use statement didn't get added to the language until F18. <laughs> uh, yeah, so on Perlmutter and many Cray systems, FTN is their compiler wrapper. Uh, so depending on which module you loaded, it invokes the, the compiler that goes with that module. And they add some certain uh, like link time flags of like, here's where you find some of the more common libraries. So, so that you don't have to remember all of that stuff for, for that specific machine. There are, there are pros and cons to that, but yeah, FTN is a compiler wrapper. It, it uses one of the specific compilers. It isn't itself a compiler. Um, if there aren't any more burning questions, I think I can give you all lunch a couple of minutes early. So I think let's do that. I will stop sharing and stop the recording and we will take a half hour for lunch.